Arthropods and other invertebrates, or creepy crawlies for those who view them in a less favourable light, comprise the massive majority of the animal kingdom. With that considered, these fascinating creatures are sadly very underrepresented in wildlife documentaries, being heavily shunted to one side in favour of charismatic megafauna. So, on the rare occasion that a documentary does emerge in which arthropods are the stars of the show, bug freaks such as myself have good reason to be excited. Monster Bug Wars is a show I dare say many of you who follow this channel are familiar with. In fact, quite a few of the species I regularly feature in my videos have made appearances in the series, such as Holoconia imanis, Ostrosalamona destructor, Typostola barbata, and of course Ethmostigmus rubripes. With that said, for those of you who aren't familiar with the show, I'll provide a quick introduction. The premise of the series is pretty succinctly explained by its name. Each episode consists of several fights, which most often involve individuals of two different invertebrate species engaging in combat, although colonies of social insects such as ants are occasionally featured. Prior to every fight, some information about each combatant is provided by Dr. Brian Grieg Fry from the University of Queensland, and Dr. Linda Rea of Cornell University. Although Rea and Fry provide much of the commentary in the lead-ups to the eventual conflicts, the program as a whole is narrated by Henry Strozier. First airing in the United States, the series consists of a single pilot episode, followed by two seasons that each consisted of multiple episodes. The pilot episode, featuring Australian invertebrates, aired in 2009, Season 1, again focused on Australian species, aired in 2011, and Season 2, this time set in Costa Rica, aired in 2012. When I first watched the show as an excited and impressionable 12-year-old, it was some pretty cool shit to use the technical term. Upon revisiting it as a deadpan, cynical 21-year-old, what was once pretty cool shit has turned to just shit. It's shit. Okay, but jokes aside, even a sardonic arsehole like me can admit that there's definitely positive elements to the show, and I'll cover those before I get into the criticism. Perhaps the best praise I can give for Monster Bug Wars is that it shines a spotlight on a wide array of obscure and little-known species. Sure, there's a few familiar faces, such as Extatosoma tyratum, Atrax robustus, and Phonutria, but aside from those relatively well-known species, the series features an immense catalogue of creatures that most viewers would have otherwise never heard of, including a diverse assortment of katydids, many of which sadly ended up as cannon fodder, endlessly bizarre and unique spiders, and of course Trolliogrelacris, which is basically every feeder cricket's revenge fantasy. In addition to this, the show's commentators, Dr. Fry and Dr. Rea, are both genuine experts, which I feel the need to point out since I've seen quite a few people in the show's YouTube comments questioning their credibility. Fry's research predominantly focuses on the evolution of venom in various animal lineages, everything from the Komodo dragon to octopuses, and he has contributed to an extensive list of academic publications. Rhea, meanwhile, is a behavioural ecologist, focusing on the evolution of social tendencies in spiders, primarily the Australian huntsman species Delina cancerides, which exhibits extended gregarious behaviour between siblings, something very unique among huntsmen and her passion for these spiders is more than evident in the show. Huntsman spiders are the best spiders in the world. Like Dr. Fry, she has contributed to an extensive catalogue of scientific publications. So I gotta commend Monster Bug Wars for this. They could have gone the typical Discovery Channel route of grabbing fake experts to tout random nonsense with a smokescreen of bogus credibility, looking at you, Megalodon, the monster shark lives, but instead they opted for using two well-accredited individuals with knowledge that is both in-depth and relevant to the subject matter at hand. 
So in short, Monster Bug Wars had pretty much everything going for it to become a top quality documentary. A premise that would interest the general populace, expert input, brilliant close-up footage, and a plethora of weird and wonderful mini-beasts. Yet in spite of the fact that it had all the ingredients of a superb program on a silver platter, it still managed to drop the ball, and quite spectacularly I might add. First up, let's talk about the sound effects, because let's face it, not discussing the sound effects in a review of Monster Bug Wars would be like not mentioning Tyrannosaurus Rex in a dinosaur documentary. Invertebrates are fascinating animals, but one issue that arises when featuring them in media is the fact that many of them are largely mute. Well, minus the cicadas that make the local bushlands sound like every failed talent show contestant got together to form a choir. Monster Bug Wars opted for a seemingly obvious solution to the general noiselessness of the world of mini-beasts, adding sound effects. That alone seems perfectly fine. Indeed, it's pretty much the staple for documentaries. But I have a slight hunch that this particular program took it a little too far. Have a listen and decide for yourselves. I don't know who was behind the sound effects or what they'd been drinking at the time, but I'm left scratching my head at how anyone could have possibly thought that'd be a good idea. Like, hey guys, here's a documentary where we have high quality footage and constant input from two very knowledgeable scientists. But you know what I think is missing? Noises that make it sound like Jurassic Park, Walking with Monsters and Primeval are all playing simultaneously in the background, with an added orchestra consisting of several hyenas being dragged down a motorway. Even without any of the other perceived flaws I'll be covering, the sound effects alone turned this series into something so goofy that it's easier to watch as a comedy than as a documentary. It draws me back to one of my major points of criticism in my video about Coyote Peterson. In that case, I was discussing the excessive usage of intense music and theatrics. Things that are most effective, or dare I say only effective, when used sparingly, and for moments where properly deserved. The same applies for Monster Bug Wars and its sound effects. And to the show's credit, Season 2 actually toned them down quite significantly. They're still there, but a lot more subtle, to the point where they actually sometimes aid the immersion as opposed to making the entire thing seem like a cheap horror film. Another thing that seems a little unnecessary to me is the overuse of CGI renderings of the various animals featured. Sure, they make for cool backgrounds when the scientists are talking, and they work well when each fight is first announced. But apart from that, I can't think of many other instances where their usage is warranted. The models are most often shown when the narrator is talking about a certain aspect of the animal's anatomy. Generally, it's weaponry. However, nearly all of the features that get discussed, such as fangs, stingers, spikes and mandibles, are large and distinctive enough to be visible in the actual footage, and the show's close-up shots are easily good enough to negate the need for CGI renders to highlight the creature's anatomy in the massive majority of cases. The only exceptions I can think of where the usage of the CGI models may be of benefit are instances where the functionality of a certain feature isn't something that can be clearly conveyed through film alone. For example, a scorpion using its pectines to home in on the vibrations generated by a moving prey item, or the rather complex appearance of a tarantula's urticating hairs. These are both phenomena that would be very difficult to capture on camera in a way that makes it obvious to viewers. Oh, and while we're on the topic of CGI, enough with the renders of venom being injected every time something lands a bite or a sting. We know the animal is venomous, we saw the killing blow happen. 
and we know exactly what is occurring without needing to constantly watch the same recycled cutscenes of yellowy green goo entering an animal's body. This show seems to be competing with the Battle of Five Armies for the greatest amount of unnecessary CGI. An additional issue I have with the series is the sometimes blatantly obvious instances of external manipulation of the subjects. Now, for those of you who don't know, Monster Bug Wars was not filmed out in the wild, save some B-roll footage. And almost all scenes of the animals were recorded in artificial environments. This alone is not something I have any problem with. It's very commonplace for documentary sequences featuring small animals to be shot in a controlled studio setting, and it certainly makes filming much easier. However, things become problematic when the animals are interfered with to the point of creating unrealistic and unnatural scenarios. In Monster Bug Wars, this is especially apparent in some fights where one combatant is at a very obvious disadvantage. For example, one such conflict involved a large wandering spider dubbed the Black Jungle Stalker in the show, and a black-faced Katie did. Katie dids, as aforementioned, were done dirty by the series. While some species featured, such as Hexacentrus mandara and Copiphora, are fierce predators, others, like Ostracellamona destructor and Fricta spinosa, are more inclined toward herbivory, and aren't much more than scavengers when it comes to animal matter, unless the potential prey is very weak. Seeing as the black-faced katydid was never shown actually hunting, I presume the species falls into the latter category. So, faced with a large spider, the katydid did what any sane insect would do, yeeted itself out of there. That much is completely plausible natural behaviour. But the show wasn't done there. According to the narration, the insect hops out to rethink its battle plan. Because I guess the Katie did is simultaneously smart enough to think of a plan, yet stupid enough to pick a fight with a giant spider. Yeah, that's the biggest case of insect anthropomorphizing I've seen since a bug's life with its talking bipedal ants. But hey, at least that was a cartoon. And what do you know, the scene cuts, and suddenly the Katie did is right next to the spider again, only to promptly get pounced on without so much as attempting an attack itself. That entire sequence, to me, reeks of external manipulation. The behaviours are completely nonsensical and unrepresentative of how actual predator-prey interactions occur. But just in case that wasn't enough, there's other scenes that are even more obviously manipulated. One fight involved a Fricta spinosa and a Nephilopilipes. Huh. Predominantly herbivorous katydid versus a hand-sized spider with one of the strongest webs in existence. Place your bets, guys. In one shot, an object can be seen prodding the katydid from behind, forcing it to jump, before cutting to a CGI rendering of the katydid colliding with the spider's web. In the House Centipede vs Swift Tree Mantid match, in which a small Seolfina species faces a significantly larger Theropoda longicornis, the mantid moves in a very unnatural manner when supposedly attacking the centipede. These odd movements, combined with the angle of its body, make it seem as though the mantid is being held off screen and shaken in front of the centipede to induce an attack. Then of course, there's the battle between the ant and wasp colonies. Here, a storm supposedly dislodges a branch occupied by a nest of Ecophila smaragdina, which falls directly onto a wasp nest. Do I need to explain why I think that entire sequence is suspicious? I'd bloody well hope not. The overarching issue I have with the aforementioned scenes is not the artificial setting in itself, but the fact that many either display implausible behaviours or compromise the immersiveness of the documentary by displaying scenes that pretty much any viewer would be able to identify as staged. Like, film in a studio all you want, but at least try to make things reflective of what takes place in the wild. Now, let's talk about the narration. This, I'll be honest, is the least of my qualms with the series. 
as for the most part there isn't anything glaringly inaccurate being stated in the show. Predictably, Dr. Rea and Dr. Fry provide generally very accurate information, and the issues I do have tend to lie with the main narrator instead. Although it isn't misinformation per se, the show does often refer to an animal's venom as deadly. Now, for whatever the prey is, that holds true. And I'm sure that's what is meant in the show, but the issue is, we live in a world where people not only despise bugs, but seemingly want to despise them, and will look for any reason at all to validate their fear and loathing. Hearing an animal being referred to as lethal or deadly only serves to reinforce that, regardless of whether the program meant it that way or not. There are a handful of instances in which blatantly inaccurate information was presented, such as a geophilomorph centipede being described as a fast and aggressive predator. An apt description for the scolopendromorph centipedes, but certainly not fitting for these near harmless soil dwellers. But ultimately my main point of contention with the narration in Monster Bug Wars is not the information itself, but the heavy use of drama and sensationalism. Like I said before, the two scientists both tend to provide very level-headed factual commentary, and in the case of Dr. Fry, some rather fitting analogies. When I heard him liken a centipede to a team of wrestlers rolled into one animal, I was dumbfounded at how I'd never thought of that myself. However, the main narrator goes way overboard with the hyperbole, repeatedly comparing the subjects to serial killers or murderers, and drawing strange comparisons that, unlike Dr. Fry's, sometimes don't really make much sense. For example, Like poison-tipped umbrellas, the spider's fangs puncture the mantis thorax. I'm sorry, what? Who the fuck tips an umbrella with poison? The evil twin sister of Mary Poppins or something? Oh, and let's not forget. The trapped centipede lashes about like a demented garden hose. Just like the sound effects, this silly, over-the-top narration style turned what could have been a worthwhile documentary series into something best watched as comedy. And on top of that, it does very little to alleviate the undeserved reputations of these already widely feared animals. They're not murderers, they're not serial killers, they're not psychopaths. They're just predatory animals doing what they need to do to survive. Mini beasts are already dealt a very unfair hand by humans. A dog can maul a child to death, yet many will seek to justify and defend its actions. However, when it comes to the denizens of the undergrowth, anything at all, no matter how trivial it is or even if it's true or not, will be taken as a reason to further justify the hatred they face from society at large. Education is key to combating this, and documentaries are a vital tool to spread knowledge, at least when done correctly. Unfortunately, Monster Bug Wars fell short in that regard, at least in my opinion. Overall, I'd rank the series at a 3.5 out of 10. If you'd like to see me do more documentary reviews, then let me know in the comments. There's plenty that I'd love to talk about. If you enjoy my content, then feel free to subscribe, let me know what you thought in the comments, and check out some of my other videos too. Thank you very much for watching, that is it from me, and I'll see you again very soon.